All right, folks. So in today's video, we are going to attempt to answer the question, what the heck is a long wire antenna? It's a question that uh, I find is confusing for new and experienced hams alike. A lot of times a new ham uh, or even an experienced ham will say things like, I don't have a lot of space. I want to get an antenna up. What should I do? And somebody will come along and say, just throw a wire in a tree. And um, I'm not real happy with that being given as an answer. And we're going to talk about that more in the video. So uh, let's get the video started. But before we do, I did want to say that down here, you're going to see some buttons. A like button, a comment button, a subscribe button. Go ahead and click them. It'll make you happy. So this is a situation that I see repeat itself over and over again. And for whatever reason, it bothers me. It rubs me the wrong way. I think that as hams, we need to do a better job as a community, helping people who have questions and sharing our collective knowledge that we have amongst each other. It'll really help us grow as a community and will help people stay engaged with the hobby. So what I have here is new hams uh, looking for HF antenna solutions are often told just throw a wire in a tree. And uh, I feel that this does hams a disservice as it's an incomplete answer to a reasonably complex challenge. The new ham specific circumstances and intended operation practices are to be considered. And when I talk about uh, specific circumstances, how much space do they have, right? Do they have a big yard, small yard? Are they gonna need to do vertical? Can they do a dipole? Uh, can they do a horizontal? Um, th there's, there's questions that need to be answered there. And then, um, also, the intended operation practices need to be considered. What bands are they talking about using? Are they going to be using 10 meters, 20 meters? Are they going to be using 80 and 160? Uh, why? And so th those are some of the questions that need to be asked. I mean, I've literally seen people say, just throw a wire in a tree and cram the end in the, in the opening on the coax. And that's just, t that's just terrible advice. Um, the other thing is, is you may want to talk about equipment that that ham has. What kind of radio? Do they have a tuner? Do they have an external SWR meter? Does, does the radio have a quality SWR meter? Those are all things that you'd want to understand before giving somebody some blanket advice. So now we're going to talk about different types of end-fed uh, wire antennas. And most of the time, people will refer to any antenna that is an end-fed wire antenna as a long wire antenna, or they'll call them a random wire antenna. A long wire antenna um, referred to as an N-fed long wire, EFLW, is defined by the ARRL as a 1.5 wavelength wire antenna. So if you had one of these on 40 meters, your antenna would be 60 meters long, 40 for one wavelength, 20 for another, 40 plus 20 equals 60. Um, there are other folks who will say that a long wire antenna is just a really, really long wire antenna. Antennas like this are not used as much today as they were in the past. Uh, it's my understanding that they were really, really popular prior to 1950. Now, I'm, I'm sure somebody will come along and be like, I use a long wire every day, son. Been using it 35 years. And that, that might be the case. And I'd love to hear the story. So if you could post some information about it down below, that would be great. But it's my understanding that these, these wire antennas, long wire antennas, are something that uh, is not widely used. Now, one of the antennas that we're going to talk about in more detail is the random wire antenna. And that's technically referred to as an N-fed random wire, EFRW. Um, it's anything but random. It's defined as a wire of a specific length that isn't resonant on any amateur radio band. So you don't want it to be resonant on 10 meters, 20, 15, 30, 40. Um, there's very specific lengths, and we're going to talk more about those specific lengths that you want to use when making a so-called random wire antenna. The other one that we're going to discuss <clears throat> is called an NFED half wave or half wave antenna, uh, EFHW. It's defined as a half of a wavelength of the lowest desired frequency. And when we talk about lowest desired frequency, let's just say I'm going to operate on 80 and up. So then I would need a antenna that's resonant on 80, roughly 130 feet long, 135 feet long, give or take, because that is a half of a wavelength on 80 meters. There are other type of wire antennas that uh, I wanted to mention, but I don't want to discuss because I think it's outside the scope of this particular conversation. And those are things like V-beams, deltas, or rhombics, uh, certain loop antennas. And I'm, I'm mentioning them because other people will be like, hey, you forgot all these other antennas. Today, specifically, I wanted to talk about random wire and N-fed half waves. 
So on the surface, there seems to be a lot of advantages to using uh, wire antennas. That's that's what I primarily use for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, is they're economical, they're low cost to buy or homebrew. Um, if you look to buy one of these, um, my antennas make some fantastic uh, NFED half waves, random wire antennas. Um, I would say check them out. Also, you can uh, look at MFJ has some that are out there. My antennas is my favorite. Vibroplex, I think, has some. Radio Wave has some. There's tons of them out there. So go out and take a look and then make sure you read the reviews on those antennas. But um, they're, they're easy to homebrew. And so that's typically what I'll do is, is make, the, make the antennas. And I have some videos on, on some of these. Um, there's tons of other videos out on YouTube to check out if you want to make a uh, NFED halfway, for example. Um, they're easy to install, and there's a variety of possible configurations. And we're going to talk more about those configurations as we go through the slide deck. Uh, one of the things I really like about them is, is they can provide multi-band operation. I don't want to mess around with a lot of switch boxes. I don't want to have to go put up an antenna, take down an antenna, use two antennas out in the backyard. I live in an HOA, and the HOA is pretty strict. And it's easy for me to kind of hide, um, and that's the next point, is, is that they're stealthy. A, a wire antenna and fed half wave uh, in the backyard, you can't even see it. Even if you're in the backyard, it's a 18-gauge it's black wire that runs up to the uh, peak of my garage, over the garage. And uh, you, you can't even see it. Um, so it was easy to install, it's easy to put up, and, it, and it's, it's uh, stealthy. The other thing is, is that these antennas are really lightweight and they're portable. So a lot of times you'll see people use these as portable um, choices for antennas when they're out in the field. So we talked about some of the advantages. Let's talk a little bit about disadvantages. The first one is, is that they're noisy and they can be prone to RFI uh, from close electrical equipment. This could be power lines. It could be telephone lines. It could be uh, your neighbor's water fountain. It could be solar panels on your house or in your neighbor's house street lights. It can be a lot of different things. Um, so a lot of times folks will use uh, RFI suppression techniques such as chokes to uh, to help uh, work through this issue. Um, they can also generate a lot of noise and upset folks. So they may cause interference with electronic devices in your house or in your neighbor's houses, like televisions, maybe wireless phones, for example, radios. Um, I had an NFED random, an NFED random wire antenna that I was using that was running really close to some Christmas lights one year. And uh, I kept kept tripping the circuit for the uh, Christmas lights and they kept turning off. And then it actually ended up, um, my GFI outlet um, actually broke. Uh, it, it ruined the GFI outlet and I had to have that replaced. The um, <clears throat> the next pieces I have in here for um, disadvantages is that it's an inconsistent radiation pattern compared to a dipole antenna. Um, because these uh, are, are really not truly resonant, uh, they either use harmonics or they use tuning to be resonant or close to resonant, I should say, on, on certain hand bands. The, the radiation patterns sometimes are a little bit uh, prickly where you get a lot of weird, goofy lobes coming off of these wires as opposed to the standard radiation pattern that you see with a dipole antenna. So that makes the way that you mount them and their use a little bit less predictable. Now you can do modeling in various pieces of software like uh, EasyNeck and uh, MMANA. But um, again, you're really just going to have to get it up and experiment with it. I haven't experienced a problem myself and I've used probably a dozen different uh, between uh, random wires and NFED antennas. And I'm going to continue to use them. They're, they're my preferred antenna of choice, as I mentioned. Um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, too. Um, the ground and the counterpoise configurations can be problematic. And because it's a single element versus a dual element, sometimes you have some uh, balance to unbalance issues and then also uh, some grounding issues. And also dealing with that noise and that RFI, counterpoises and grounds play a factor in that. And that can be uh, a little bit of a challenge to overcome as well. So the first one we're going to talk about is the NFED random wire. And I have uh, length of these antennas is anything but random. We've kind of talked about that. They should be non-resonant on any amateur radio frequency or multiple of any frequency. Um, they tend to have very high impedance. And so what that means is that you have a mismatch between your antenna feed line and the actual antenna itself. So folks use what's called an un, -un. Some people will call them a ballon. Uh, typical names for them are matchbox, transmission line uh, transformer, or impedance matching unit. When people say those words, it all means the same thing. For NFED random wires, uh, the transformer has a ratio that brings the impedance of the antenna down to that of the coax line or close and matches, matches that. 
Um, the ratio typically is nine to one. Now I'm sure some people will be like, I use an eight to one, or I use a 14 to one, a five to one. Nine to one is the most commonly used ratio. And that really pulls you down from about 450 ohms down to about 50 ohms. Um, but it doesn't always get you at 50. So with NFEN random wire antennas, uh, you do want to use a tuner. And sometimes folks will say, well, my 7300 has a tuner and it's got a three to one tuner. Is that good enough? It might be in certain cases. It may not be in other cases. So typically folks would try to use like a 10 to one or higher uh, tuner to work with NFED random wire antennas. We're going to take a quick look at this website, uh, hamuniverse.com, uh, random wire antenna lengths uh, right now, but it'll also be linked down below. I found this to be one of the more useful sites for random wire antennas. So again, I'll include this link below as well, and then you can check it out. Um, this person tells a little bit of a story about building an uh, NFED uh, random wire antenna. And what's important is, is they go over the different multiples of resonant frequencies. Uh, the most important piece of it here, it says, here are the final numbers, in my opinion, in green below that would be good for a long wire antenna. You may want to take note of them. And that is a random wire antenna, which we discussed is anything but random. Now, I've used 29 feet, 35.5 feet, 41, 58, and 71. And I've had great success on all of them. Uh, one of the ones I use a lot is a 35.5 foot antenna. And it works really well on 15, 20, and 40 with a 9 to 1 on none. So you might want to check this out. It's an easy way to get a smaller antenna up in a stealth kind of configuration that people won't stop and point at. Now we're going to talk a little bit about NFED half wave antennas. And so the length of these antennas is limited to one half of a wavelength of the lowest desired frequency. I think we talked about that a little bit earlier too. They should be resonant on that specific amateur radio frequency and subsequently multiples of any higher frequency. So for example, an 80 meter NFED half wave, that's the one we talked about 135 feet, give or take, um, will work on 40 meters, 20 meters, 15 meters, and 10 meters. And it may even work on other uh, bands with the use of a, of a tuner. Um, these tend to have very high impedance, uh, much higher than a random wire. And so, uh, and on and again is used uh, matchbox transmission line and transformer impedance matching unit. But the difference is, is that the ratio here is generally 49 to 1. Now you will see 64 to 1, but generally 49 to 1 is what's used most. And that's going to take you from 2,450 ohms down to about 50. Now what's really nice about these NFED half wave antennas is it doesn't require the use of a tuner. Now many folks will still use a tuner like a 3 to 1 that's built into most modern radios to touch up because you might be a little bit off. Uh, for a couple of different reasons. Bands are very wide and an antenna is only truly resonant on one particular frequency. It's near resonant or mostly resonant on adjacent frequencies. The other thing is, is that uh, you may have a, let's talk about a 40 meter NFED half wave that you've tuned for 7.1. So that means its next harmonic frequency at the 20 meter band is actually 14.2. And then it becomes 28.4 on 10 meters. And a 28.4 might be a little bit further away from the FT8 band that you want to use. So you're going to use a touch-up tuner to kind of bring you in. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Antennas. Now, when you play around with these antennas, and especially if you build them, um, people say, well, do I need an antenna analyzer to do this? And I'm going to say yes. Now, there's a variety of analyzers, and you can see them here, that range from $49 all the way up to $1,500. Um, Pick one that works for you and for your budget. I recommend the Nano VNA. Um, I do have a few videos out, and there's tons of other videos out um, showing folks how to use a Nano VNA. It's easy to use, easy to connect to your computer. Um, really a fantastic antenna analyzer that will help you learn a lot about antennas. But if you're going to hang antennas up and you're going to mess with them and you're going to want to do multi-banded operation, um, I don't know what I would do without an analyzer. So many folks will ask, how do I mount them? Uh, when you talk about an NFED uh, antenna, there's a lot of configurations, a lot of variety of configurations that you can use. Uh, horizontally is one. So one of the first ones that I had came out of a second story window of my house and just ran all the way across the yard and terminated in a tree. Um, it was about 17 feet off the ground, so it was like an NVIS type antenna. And we'll talk more about NVIS propagation in another video, not this one. Um, but it was just a horizontally mounted antenna, and it, it worked reasonably well. I was pretty happy with it. Another configuration that you'll see is an inverted L, and so that's when the antenna starts at the ground, comes up, takes a turn, and then goes over. 
and it kind of looks like an L shape and um, it's called an inverted L and they work, they work really well. And a lot of people are pretty happy with them. Um, I generally prefer an inverted V over that, which is like an inverted V dipole configuration, but that's where you have your one end of your antenna mounted to like a post or a fence or something like that it goes up and then it comes down and terminates to another post or fence. Um, and it looks like an upside down V. So folks call that an inverted V. The radiation pattern off of an inverted V is similar to a dipole on the resonant frequency of your NFED half wave. Um, it's different for the random wire, but uh, inverted V configurations are really, really helpful. Um, the other one that I use a lot is a sloper, and that's where I'll start with the un un or the matching unit close to the ground. Folks generally say that you want to keep those around four feet uh, or lower off the ground. It just helps with the earthing and the conductivity of the earth. Um, and then you just slope up at an angle as close to 45 degrees as you can make it. Sometimes it's greater than that. Sometimes it's less than that. Um, I've even seen uh, where folks will try to mount uh, a wire straight up and they call it a vertical. And it, the other one I mentioned here is somewhat popular. You don't see it a whole heck of a lot. It's called a half square. And that's where you start off the ground, you go up, you go across like an inverted L, but then you come back down to the ground. I have not uh, used one of these, but I did recommend a half square to a buddy of mine who had a house that was on a, uh, a small piece of property and he was going to go up over the house and then back down on the other side. I need to follow up with him and see if he did that or not. But um, that is the half square. So here's a tricky question, and uh, I'm probably going to shy away from it a little bit, but it really says, do I need to ground my antenna? And what I want to say is, is antenna and station grounding are a best practice. Keep in mind that I'm not giving you grounding advice. I don't want you to burn your house down and say, hey, Ape said to do this. So this is not giving you grounding advice, and I'm not telling you how to ground. Um, what I will say is, is antenna and station grounding can help with noise, RFI. We talked a little bit about that. It can help reduce static buildup on the antenna. Your antenna gets uh, electrically charged with static electricity, and it's bad to leave that up there. Um, and it also can possibly give you a level of lightning protection. For more information, uh, I would go to the ARRL website on grounding, and we're going to take a look at that now, and we're going to link that below. Now I'll include a link to this website below, but for more information on grounding and grounding best practices, you can start with the Amateur Radio Relay League. This is a great site and it goes over a little bit of an introduction as to why grounding is important and why it's so controversial. Controversial. Um, down here you'll see some grounding fact where it talks about how important is a ground. Uh, they'll talk about the difference between a safety ground, a lightning ground, and RF ground. Um, there's some questions down here about using counterpoises versus a ground. Um, and they even talk a little bit about uh, folks who claim that uh, antennas don't require a ground. And there's some articles and web links linked below. But I just wanted to include this so you guys have some more references to investigate when learning more about grounding. So the next question is, what about RFI and do I need a choke? And the short answer is it depends. Um, I always choke my wiring antennas at the antenna feed point. Some people don't do that. Um, I do that because I use a counterpoise and I attach a counterpoise to the matching unit and I use that to help balance that antenna. Some folks say that, well, you can just use the coax, uh, or the, the outer shield of your coax as your counterpoise and that works fine. It might, it doesn't for me. When I do that, I see increased levels of RFI and noise and I don't like that. So I choke it at the antenna feed point. Another thing that people say to do is choke it at the tuner or the radio uh, feed points where your coax comes in the house and connects into your shack. Um, I choke there as well. So that way I kind of am bi-directionally protected. And if you have really, really long runs of coax, some folks say to even put a choke in the middle there. Um, I don't do that. I'm running about 100 feet of RG8X right now out to my, to my antenna. I have a choke at the feed point of the antenna with counterpoise, and then I have a choke at the, at the back of the tuner. And that seems to work well for me. I think what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to set up your antenna, see if you got noise, and then start reducing that noise through RFI suppression techniques and uh, see what you can do. Now, for more information, and we're going to take a look at these websites now, um, Palomar Engineers, they have some ferrite products that help you figure out what kind of suppression you need or if you want to build your own or buy your own, you can do both on that website. Um, and then there's also uh, a topic that they cover on NFED half wave antennas and kind of show the choke technique that I just described. And we'll take a quick look at that now. And those links will be below. 
For a little bit more information about chokes or even making your own choke, I'm going to link this uh, website from Palomar Engineers or this webpage, I should say, from Palomar Engineers. And in here, they talk about ferrite mix selection and guidelines. Uh, and this is for folks who want to roll their own uh, choke or the own choke ballon. You can buy them off of, um, you can buy the cores off of Palomar Engineering, or you can actually buy pre-made chokes. But uh, this goes through the difference between the mixes, which bands they're most resonant on, uh, which ones you want to use for RFI and EMI suppression, and that's what a choke does. Um, and you come down here, there's some charts, some information, and I believe there is a frequently, here it is, frequently asked questions that uh, help make sure that you're buying a good ferrite core for what you're trying to do. Also, what I did want to point out, and I'll include this link below on Palomar Engineers' website, they talk specifically about NFED antennas and where and why you want to choke them. And then this is a diagram of a typical NFED antenna system. Uh, here you have, a you have an image that depicts your antenna. Now, whether that's a vertical, a horizontal, inverted V, an inverted L, sloper antenna, it doesn't matter. This just represents that antenna. And what you see is, is that Z is your uh, impedance matching components um, that you're going to want to put on there like your, like your, um, your ballon or, or your uh, unun, I should say. And then um, your coaxial braid here, it says it radiates. They depict a counterpoise system that you might want to use. Uh, you can use a ground in, in lieu of that. But here you have what they call feed line choke, and that's FC. And in this particular diagram, they have that right before the radio, which is marked R. And then they show your station ground. I do like to put a choke, another feed line choke, right after Z. Um, not everybody likes to do that. I prefer to do it. There have been instances where I haven't. But anyhow, this will be linked below uh, to help you out as well. Now, here's the point in the video where we're done. And I say thanks to everybody for watching. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below and I'll do my best to respond. Thanks again, everybody.